Facebook. Welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes, see if I can get some more people joining. Uh, Slam, Sarib, how are you? Are you well? Thanks for the wave. So, yesterday I spoke about a top 10 tips for surgical dentistry. Today we're going to talk a little bit more about dental implants and what is a dental implant and in which, uh, what clinical indications would we use a dental implant. So that's the topic of discussion and by her eyesons have kindly posted me out some uh, dummy implants which I'm going to talk you through. So I'm going to talk you through exactly what this is, what part goes into the patient's jaw and then I've got some other components here. What's this? Obviously this is not real life size, uh, this is just for demonstration, but it's quite good for me to be able to illustrate to you guys exactly the components that we use. So that's the plan today. Uh, if you have any questions, pop them down. Um, again, I'm live on Facebook, I'm live on Instagram. If you'd like to join me, hi, um, uh, hi uh, Imran, hope you're well. <laughs> you like my hair too? Uh, yeah, it's a bit out of control, so uh, I'm about three weeks overdue a haircut and I'm just going to let it grow until uh, lockdown's over and my hairdresser can fit me in. Uh, but it's a bit wild. Uh, but it is what it is, you know. It is what it is. Uh, the other option is I take the clippers to it and I really don't want to do that. So I'm just going to wait. Uh, okay, so another couple of minutes and we'll make a start. Uh, so it's just sort of uh, going over. So yesterday I spoke about 10 top tips for surgical dentistry, a number of things, I can't really remember them all now, but from, you know, uh, visualizing, writing down what you plan to do, make sure you're working within your competence, all the way to, you know, local, uh, your local anesthetic technique and thinking about what local anesthetic technique you're going to use and thinking about the post-op care you give your patients, etc. Last week I also spoke about uh, five top tips for getting started into your implant journey. I talked about mentoring, etc, etc. And I think uh, those videos are on my YouTube channel. There, uh, so uh, my YouTube channel, uh, please, uh, you can pop along to there and all these videos get uploaded onto my YouTube channel. So I'm just going to turn the music down. So the plan today is just to go over what's a dental implant and you know, some of the clinical scenarios that we'd utilize a dental implant. And then I'm gonna go through, uh, I've got a dummy implant here and I'm just gonna go through that with you. So it's not gonna to be too long today. So uh, a dental implant is a prosthetic device that goes inside the bone and it provides retention and support for a crown. Uh, so we're able to uh, replace a missing tooth for our patients. And they've been used not only for single teeth, but for multiple teeth and for full mouth. And it certainly has advantages compared to a, a bridge or a denture or a portal denture. For instance, with a dental bridge, we often have to drill sound tooth and, uh, and often a tooth either side of the gap. So the abutments need to be uh, drilled so we're often uh, d destroying good sound tooth structure and then to, to hold a bridge in place and then replace the gap. Uh, partial dentures can be quite bulky, irritating for our patients, they move during function and then obviously a, a, a complete denture uh, you know really limits uh, potentially for our patients how they can chew, it can affect their speech uh, it can affect their confidence and dental implants offer a really good solution to replace a missing uh, gap or gaps for our patients and really you know in the right situation they really are the best option for our patients to restore restore a gap so uh, as I said I've got a, a dummy implant here so it's not real life size this implant uh, but by horizons have kindly uh, posted this out for me so I can use it in my video. So here is a typical uh, fixture that I would use uh, in for my patients and it comes 
comes like this and it comes with a screw retained carrier so this part of the top which is gold coloured I hope you can all see it is what we call a screw retained carrier so I've got an instrument here and I can unscrew it so it's either that you can call it a screw retained carrier or you can call it a mount and the implant comes in sterile packaging and you there's an attachment that goes on top of this mount to lift the implant out and what you really need to be doing is once you lift the implant out of the sterile packaging it should be going directly into the osteotomy that you've created so you can unscrew this and I don't know if you can hear that clicks and, and this is what will happen in, you know, with your implants you hear a double click and then there's a screw and this is the screw I hope you can see it so I'm on Instagram and uh, Facebook so uh, my eyes are on my phone that's linked to Instagram it's not that I'm a, you know I'm ignoring you guys on Facebook just so that's the screw that comes off and then this is the three-in-one abutment and you'll see there's a hex so it's six sides so this three-in-one abutment is a hex and it's color coded okay and the color coding relates to the implant diameter so if I put this down so here's the implant and dental implants come in various widths and sizes and lengths. So anywhere, you can get implants as short as four millimeter, all the way up to zygomatic implants that can go up to 60 millimeters. So there's a wide range. But conventional implants in the jaw are usually somewhere in the region of six to 15 millimeters long. So if that's a dental implant, this is a tapered implant. When I mean tapered, it's broad at the, at the coronal aspect, the top part, and towards the apex it's tapered it's threaded so it's got a thread design and different implant companies have different thread designs different thread pitch a different amount of th a thread number so they all vary and uh, so this is a, a tapered uh, implant and it's got a quite an aggressive thread and I won't go into it but the thread pitch and the aggressiveness of a thread really lends itself to a specific clinical situation uh, if you, uh, when you're placing dental implants. And then we have the internal aspect of the implant. So again, you can see it's color coded, so it's green. And I know looking at that with the bi-horizon system, the green means that the platform, so the, inter the width internally is 4.5 millimeters. So this is a green uh, and it's all to, it's color coding. And you can see the internal aspect so this is what we call an internal hex. So the hex, the six positions that you can fit the abutment uh, which holds the crown in, it can go in six ways. So every 60 degrees, you can put, you can change the direction. All right, so every 60 degrees. So it's got six positions. So it's, this is an internal hex implant. Now, uh, as opposed to some implants for, which are external hex, i.e., the hex would be above uh, the, the platform. So this is the platform and the, the hex would be uh, superficial or above that platform. Now, although you probably can't see this uh, implant is threaded all the way down, it's just that the thread, the threads at the top or the head of the implant are really quite uh, thin and you maybe not see them clearly. Uh, so that's a internal tapered uh, implant with an int what we would say internal a uh, correction uh, internal connection and it's a hex now although this particular implant is a hex connection within different implant systems the connections can vary they can be trilobe so th the, the connection is th uh, fits three different ways so every 120 degrees you can rotate it a different way or uh, it can be octagonal so it can fit into eight different positions but so it varies uh, between uh, implant systems etc and even within implant systems they can have a variation uh, uh, of d d sort of uh, design features you know there's real advantages for dental implants remember when we place an implant into a space we're, we're preserving the bone because we then start to load that bone if we have a gap if we just leave it and then the bones not loaded it will just atrophy it's like muscles if you're if you're a weightlifter 
and you're going regularly, you build your muscles up. And then if you don't go for a prolonged period of time, what happens is you get muscle wasting. Same happens to the bone of the jaw. If we're able to load it, put uh, an implant into a gap where we lost a tooth, uh, then we can uh, load the bone and that sort of slows down that whole uh, resorption pattern. Uh, so yeah, so this is a dental implant. I just want to show you a couple of other things I've got here. Uh, I think I dropped something, did I? So this is a cover screw. A large cover screw. I think I dropped something. Oh yeah, let me get it under my table. Right, ah, I dropped the, my driver. Okay, so uh, this is a cover screw, and and so implant and cover screw. Now, what I usually do is when I place my implants, I bury them, and then I I would just put a cover screw on top. So the cover screw just screws into the implant. And the implants just, I usually play, place my implant subcrestal, so below the bone level. So the implant uh, is uh, set into its final position and then the cover screw goes over and then I, I suture the gum over. So that's a cover screw. And I think, uh, you know, if you're starting off and getting to, uh, want to get into dental implants, it's important that you know what uh, the parts are called. So we've got the dental implant and then we've got the cover screw. You, you can see again, it's color coded to just make it all, all this part all uh, so much simpler for yourself starting off and then for uh, colleagues that maybe don't do the surgery, maybe restore or uh, for, for team members. So that's a cover screw and it just fits on and screws in. Some people uh, like to place a healing abutment at time of surgery and this is a healing abutment with my driver. So this is a, again, it's color coded. So this is a healing abutment. And so some people will place an implant if they're happy with the stability, i.e. how well the implant goes in, then they will just place a healing abutment. And so that again just fits on. And what the healing abutment allows is for the tissue to form a nice cuff around the implant. So there's a nice uh, aesthetic and cleansable shape to the gum as it develops around the implant as it heals. So some people choose to place a healing abutment at the time of implant placement. And so this is a healing abutment. Uh, I, however, choose to, the vast majority, 95% of my cases, I always like to place a cover screw. So what will happen is, after a period of uh, integration, three months, I will uncover the implant. I'll take the cover screw off. And I will check that I'm happy with the implant that is integrated, and then I will place the healing abutment and I'll leave that to heal for a couple of weeks and then I'll I'll go to the to the restorative phase of, of uh, restoring and delivering uh, the final crown to the patient okay uh, so that's all the parts just really basic so a dental implant a cover screw and the healing abutment and as I said this is not obviously real size this is just a, a, a model for demonstration purposes and uh, if there's any questions about, uh, uh, yeah, Tahid saying don't drop the implant, yeah. I dropped something earlier, it wasn't the implant. You don't want to drop the implant when you're obviously doing the surgery because if you drop the implant then, uh, you know, that's it wasted for the bin. It has to be sterile. And as I said, you know, the implant comes uh, with a, a carrier like this and, and, you know, as soon as it comes out the sterile pouch, you want to deliver it to the to the patient and into the osteotomy. You don't want to, you don't want the implant touching any soft tissue. You don't want saliva going over it. You want it direct into the osteotomy and the quicker you can do it, I really feel the, the, the better. So any questions, uh, happy to, oh, I'll go to Instagram first. Is there any people, thank you all, a lot of, any questions? Thoughts on zirconia versus titanium healing abutments. Uh, someone's asking uh, my thoughts on zirconia versus titanium healing abutments. I don't have experience with uh, zirconia. Uh, I've not. I've no experience with zirconia healing abutments, but I know zirconia is very tissue friendly. So I can imagine, uh, you know, you get really nice tissue healing with a, a zirconia abutment or, or zirconia. Uh, yeah, zirconia uh, abutments, uh, but uh, generally I'm 
uh, you know, using a, a titanium a abutment uh, the, mo the majority of the times. Uh, have I ever dropped any implants? Yes, I've dropped implants into a patient's mouth and then that's really not ideal. And then, but you know, that's why I carry a large stock. So if that happens, I can always just get that implant replaced from the company and I just open up another one. Okay, I'm gonna have a look on Facebook. Any questions? Uh, so really, you know, we're gonna go back to basics and about implant treatment, uh, dental implants, really small bite size information on what is an implant, that's what I've covered today. And so really it's a titanium screw that's put into, inserted into, you know, you, you prepare the jaw, bone, uh, you uh, create an osteotomy and the implant fits into the osteotomy and then you leave it to heal for a period of time and then it also, the titanium it also integrates to the patient's bone or, or the bone also integrates to the, the implant and then you can uh, fabricate the final restoration for the patient. Best way for a foundation to, and to get into the field of implant dentistry, I'm considering some courses going abroad too. Ah, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I sort of uh, mentioned the best way to get started into implant dentistry the last time. Yep, absolutely, you need to identify courses. Uh, really, really important to identify uh, courses, you know, get advice from people. Uh, think about the investment that you're gonna make in a course and think, you know, you want to recoup that investment down the line uh, when, you, when you've when you started to, uh, you know, bring implant dentistry into your clinical practice. So, you know, some courses are 20, 30,000 pounds. You know, just be wary that you're going to get that investment uh, back uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the new skill that you're learning. And so that would be the first thing. And at this moment in time during lockdown, there's this a huge tsunami of webinars going on all about various things so really take uh, you know take advantage of all the learning that's available at the moment uh, and it's all for free and it's only you know this is a, f a first that people are out there giving their sharing their knowledge so take advantage of that and uh, make the most of it get you know if you've identified a course that you're thinking of going on then ask other people that have maybe been on that course for feedback the, the second thing i spoke about uh, was about mentoring how important that is you know identify mentors to help you in your journey because it's fine you'll you'll do it on your own but you know how about doing it faster how about doing it without making mistakes uh, having someone to mentor you certainly you know makes that whole process much more efficient the, the third thing I mentioned about sort of starting off an implant dentistry, you know, get get involved in social media, you know, so many different platforms, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, I have a YouTube channel, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I utilise all these mediums uh, for, for learning for myself and for putting out education and that's so, so important, try to develop a niche. Then I spoke about, uh, I spoke about, you know, the environment that you're working in. So it's very well doing a course, but you, but your environment where you work needs to be supportive of, of your career development and your career plans and your career goals. So you need people to support you in that journey with an implant dentistry. You also need uh, to get the patients, you know, so if you're an associate, how's the principal going to help you uh, get patients to, for you to, to do the implant work and, you know, they, are they going to mark it? Uh, so that's really, really important. It's you know, it's very well spending ten, twenty thousand learning a new skill, but actually, you know, to to bring that into practice to get a return on investment in your training to really develop the skill that you've learned. It's not enough just going on a course. You need to be doing it, on, doing the treatment on patients, and you need the patients for that. So think about how you're going to get the patients, i.e., bums on seats. And you know, is it are you going to discount? Are you going to heavily market, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So, uh, you, you know, really think about that aspect. And uh, the last thing I sort of spoke about when it came to starting off an implant dentistry was set yourself specific goals. You know, if you go on a course and you spend X amount, you've invested a lot of money, then you have to set yourself goals. And 
you know, do your utmost to achieve those goals and you need to be, you know, review those goals on a weekly basis. I, I've done an implant course, I've spent 20,000. I, in my first year, I want to place between 50 to 100 implants. You need to be thinking about that all the time. And if you're thinking about it all the time, it will happen. But if you just go, yeah, I'm going to, I want to place implants this year, then it's, it, you know, you've not really set yourself a specific goal uh, that your then your mind tells you you need to achieve. Uh, how about building portfolio abroad, then applying to private practice using this as CV? Okay, excellent, really good question. So yeah, I went abroad to Brazil when I learned about uh, zygomatic implants. I went to Brazil about three years ago and it was a week long intensive training course, uh, six, seven days. There was a group of us that went over and I placed somewhere in the region of 10 to 12 zygomatic implants, but got a huge wealth of experience. And then that gave me uh, the knowledge and the skill to come back to the UK to then start offering this treatment to my patients. And I, t I take over groups of uh, clinician clinicians over to countries where we uh, create intensive weeks of training. And I think that's a really good way to learn, but it's not the only way. You know, I think you still need to make sure that you have a structured course that you're following and you need a mentor. Uh, it's crucial, but yeah, absolutely. You know, if you can go somewhere abroad for 10 days and place 100 implants, you know, you're really going to upskill uh, dramatically. And uh, I've done it, so uh, I would, I, I, you know, I, I, I found it really worthwhile and I'd, I'd encourage other people to do it. Who was the best worst? It's been doing your mentor job. Okay, Cal uh, hi, Callie, how are you? <laughs> yeah, uh, Callie, uh, when she was. 15 or 16 did work experience with me in Springburn and uh, now she's a high-flying uh, cosmetic dentist. I don't think that was anything to do with me, uh, all to do with her and her drive and ambition. But thank you for your comment. Any questions? Any questions? Best way to involve yourself in, if you're in the hospital doing... Okay, yeah, Elias, really, really good question. What I would say to people that are in, you know, so uh, within the UK, often we, we do uh, VT, so vocational or foundation. When I was younger, it was called uh, vocational training. That's fine. And then, you know, if you're fortunate and you work in a dental practice where you've got dentists that are doing implants, then really get involved, you know, ask to, to watch them. Uh, I think that's, you know, vital. When I was in VT, I got to visit another implant dentist and watch him do some implants. And that was just off, cu off the cuff. I, at that point in my career, I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't know I would be in, involved as impl in implant dentistry as heavily as I am now. And then uh, during a, F a sort of uh, SHO year, I worked in surgical units. So if you're not able to, to see implants being done uh, within your foundation dental uh, practice, then, you know, on your days off or uh, weekends or evenings, you know, develop a network of people that don't mind you coming to watch them doing implants. So there's no excuse, you know, you, even though you're, the dental practice you work in doesn't offer dental implants, there are loads of people that are happy for other dentists to come and watch them. And, uh, and I'm one of them. I routinely have people traveling hundreds of miles to come and watch the dental implant treatment that I'm offering all the time, you know, and, and that just shows commitment. And I did that, you know, to upskill. And, and even now, if there was a procedure that I wanted to uh, refine or upskill in or a, a new procedure that I wanted to learn, then I would travel to learn from the best. And, and a lot of these guys are happy letting you watch f for free. And, and I'm the same. I don't mind people coming to watch me do implants. Uh, and no problem at all. All you need to do is drop me a message, or get you know, uh, or an email. I'm I'm all over the place. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, no problem. Uh, but so when you're in when you're in as an SHO in hospital, I I would say you you just need to develop a network, get involved within your a uh, dental implant community, within your dental community, then within the dental implant community. I'm a member of the ADI. 
So a, a committee board member and I encourage a dentist starting off to get involved and become members of organisations such as the ADI, such as the ITI. You know, there's a wealth of information online. The ITI, for instance, have got a great online teaching academy. There's so much information on that and it's free for members. The ADI put on study clubs. We put on educational events. Uh, we have a ADI specific uh, members forum on Facebook that has hundreds of some of the leading implant dentists in the country and it's a simple matter of hi uh, you know I'm a young implant dentist what would you advise what course would you advise me to do and you'll get loads of people giving you advice and then when you're more experienced you know you're like you can put up an x-ray or clinical images and you go you know guys I I'm struggling with this case this is the problem what are your thoughts and people are more than happy to help out so uh, that's what I would say we'll come to observe you after lockdown yep no problem honestly uh, I'm more than happy for people to come and observe me doing work whatever uh, any other questions uh, it's important because I think for a lot of uh, younger dentists they're not guided or shown or advised uh, on steps to take and uh, you know I was I've got to where I am because I've had people help me advise me guide me uh, and I've no doubt that I would have got there but you know, I've got there at the speed I've got there because people have helped me. We all need help and, and there's nothing to, to shy away from in asking for help. And it's as simple as, you know, call someone up, drop them a message and say, I'd really appreciate your advice. Do you mind uh, having a chat with me? I chat to den dentists, less experienced and more experienced and exchanging advice all the time. Uh, and, and, and it's important early on, build up a network of people that, you know, you can count on and you can trust and get yourself known. Uh, what is a multi-unit abutment? Okay, so good question. So a multi-unit abutment is something that's used to move the restorative platform above uh, the internal connection. So if you imagine when we place an implant and we can put an attachment on which takes uh, the interface away from the bone the bone implant level and we use multi-unit implants when we do uh, we don't use them on single fixtures we use them when we do uh, two and more so a short span bridge work or full arch implants and it, a number of reasons we can what we can do with multi-unit abutments we can angle correct with them so you get straight you get 17 degree you get 30 degree and actually you can get a higher degree correction so if an implant's placed at a a screw with angle for some reason, maybe it's intentionally, you can angle correct with multi-units. You can also, uh, what you're doing is, as I said, remove moving that restorative platform higher up. By moving that restorative platform higher up, that, cr that sort of fragile junction between implant and bone interface, you're not disturbing it, so it's the one abutment, one time concept. And it's shown that if, you, if we're disturbing that junction on a regular basis, it can lead to some bone loss. The other thing with a multi-unit abutment is that it allows you to make a bridge as passive as possible. So the, the, the bridge or the prosthetic part of the restoration, it needs to be passive. So i.e. when it's screwed in to the implant, eh, there's no tension placed in the implant and a multi-unit abutment allows you to make or fabricate a, a, a prosthesis that's more passive. Uh, so uh, I'm sure there's other uh, reasons and what is a multi-unit abutment but i hope that helps therefore tissue level bone level and bone tissue level is better okay uh so i don't have i've only ever placed a handful of tissue level abutments i'm more uh much more towards a, a bone level a uh, implant like this uh but uh, i wouldn't say one is better than the other not in my experience because these work I'd, I've done hundreds, if not thousands of these implants and they work, and they work really well. So it's not that one is better than another. I think uh, certainly there are clinicians that are more inclined to using a tissue level implant and that's what you know they, they use and they favour it, but it's not that one is better than the other. Uh, and there's advantages and disadvantages to everything. You know, there's advantages and disadvantages to each implant system. Uh, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that one is better than the other. Any other questions? Good, uh, thank you very much for all those people that have asked the questions. Uh, 
I love questions. Anything, I'm happy to answer more questions. If so, otherwise, I've spoken for about 25 minutes and that's uh, usually enough. Okay, stay safe and I'll be back on tomorrow. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to speak about tomorrow, but I will we'll decide later on today or tomorrow. If you have any suggestions on topics that you'd like me to cover in respect to starting your implant journey or basic surgical skills or basic implant techniques, then I'm happy to take advice. Could you go through consent process increase? Okay, yeah. Going through the risks, it seems like patients would be put off. Okay, yeah, okay. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that on board. I will certainly cover uh, the consent process or or sort of a, the communication that you need to have with a patient. You know, it's for me, the biggest and the most important uh, thing is when we're talking to our patients is you need to gain the patient's trust and you need to be honest and and you gain trust and and with a patient it's just experience you know the most patients you speak to and ultimately you need to know what you're talking about and you can't you can't uh, you know pull the wool over a patient when you know what you're talking about that clearly shows through uh, when you're uh, discussing treatment with a patient uh, because I'm quite confused myself our baby or empower danger to me Okay, uh, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. You know, there are times where, so, Vish is asking, you know, he's quite, he sometimes finds it difficult to decide between a denture, a resin retained bridge or an implant. Absolutely, you know, uh, and it's important. And there's sometimes I say to my patients, you know, a dental implant isn't the right thing here. You're better off with a resin retained bridge. And, and that's the case. You know, but you know, I am not saying a dental implant is the answer for every gap. It is not. Absolutely, that is not the case. But dental implants uh, offer a solution for missing a uh, spaces uh, that is uh, cost effective. It's cost effective and long term. Uh, but it's not the only solution. Basic surgical skill flap to in my mouth. Okay, perfect. I'm getting some great suggestions. I really appreciate them, and uh, I will. Uh, I will hope to cover them over the next few days and into next week. Thanks a lot, guys. Stay safe. And thanks for everybody and their kind comments.